Okay, my name is Michael Petrushek. Um, I'm in the um, Department for Molecular Medicine, and my lab is interested in aging and age-related disease. And what we're particularly interested in is new mechanisms by which we could, um, uh, we want to identify new me mechanisms by which you could uh, um, treat those diseases. And the way we go about this is somewhat unusual because the first thing we do, we screen large libraries of chemicals for those that extend lifespan in C. elegans. And then, so far we have screened 95,000 compounds and identified about 100 compounds that extend lifespan. And then we use those compounds and um, test them on various models of age-related disease. And if you find something interesting, um, we go back and try to identify the mechanism of action um, in order to uh, develop better and to better hits than the original hits we had. And that's essentially what I'm going to tell you today. Okay, aging drives a lot of diseases like cancer, neurodegeneration, stroke, arthritis, and heart disease through a number of physiological and molecular changes that inactivate protective mechanisms. So the problem is that it is exactly those protective mechanisms that we like, would like to activate by drugs to um, uh, treat the disease. So a while ago, we asked, how do we ensure that the uh, targets <coughs> remain druggable in advanced age? And we didn't really have a good answer to that, except that we should do phenotypic screenings in old model organisms. And that's why we're generally using, uh, what, that's why we generally use C. elegans. Uh, this is the life history of a worm. You can see it starts as an egg, goes through four larval stages, then for the first five days becomes a reproductive adult, and by day 20, um, the most of the worms are already dead. And th this is pretty much the only organism that you can keep in 384 well played that ages rapidly enough so that you have an unlimited amount of old animals. And here is what happens when the animal ages to a lot of the protective pathways. So here are uh, um, uh, the four panels represent four different uh, strains that report on oxidative stress response, top panel. Uh, now it works, okay. And then here you can see uh, the um, ER unfolded protein response. This is a reporter for the mitochondrial unfolded protein response, and this is a reporter for the heat shock response. And what you can see, the simple thing we did is we just challenged those, uh, um, we activated those stress responses by different stressors in day one, day five, and day eight old animals. And what we see is that, or what you can see here is, here is quantified, uh, is that with age, there is a dramatical decrease in the responsiveness, uh, stress responsiveness. And essentially, by day eight, the animal is post-stress responsive. And that worried us somewhat, because when we had screened for those compounds, we always added the drugs on day one, and we knew that some of the drugs we had were actually dependent on these pathways to extend lifespan. And the prediction was that when you would add those drugs to an old animal, they would no longer work, and that's exactly um, what happens. So here we have 21 drugs, and you can see they beautifully extend lifespan if you add them to young day one adults by 15 to 50 percent, but most of the drugs no longer work um, because the pathways they engaged are no longer engageable in the old animal. There was one exception, however, and that was minocycline. It's a tetracyclic antibiotic FDA approved, FDA approved for acne, and some of you may have heard of this one. So um, <coughs> minocycline, minocycline and doxycycline are known to have a lot of other effects besides um, being antibiotic. So if you add that to a young worm, you get about a 50% increase in lifespan, and if you add that to a day eight worm, uh, you get still a 20% increase in lifespan. And more importantly, if we put that drug onto uh, uh, worms that expressed alpha-synuclein fused to YFP in their heads, so these are heads of worms, day 8, 11, 16, 18, you can see that as they age, the staining becomes more and more punctate, indicative of alpha-synuclein aggregation. So if we add minocycline, that aggregation is totally gone. And the most important part of this slide is actually here. So this is number of aggregates as a function of age. So when we started minocycline treatment on day eight, where all the protective uh, uh, um, folding machineries were no longer activatable in worms, we still got a reduction 
of the alpha synuclein aggregation. So then um, Jeff Kelly actually alerted us to the fact that other people have found uh, uh, minocycline, and uh, actually doxycycline and minocycline in clinical trials for amyloidosis to be protective. So we went to clinical trials, Oregon we found over 100 clinical trials that are either completed or ongoing for various diseases uh, um, related to aging that were, uh, for which minocycline was tested. So not of all of these turned out well, and we thought one of the confounding factors of all these uh, clinical trials is that this is still an antibiotic and chronic antibiotic treatment is a problem. So we decided we need to figure out how minocycline works and how it extends lifespan and reduces protein aggregation. And the way we did this, we used an unbiased approach with activity-based protein profiling that was developed um, by Ben Cravat. And essentially, you have a probe, idocetamide, that binds reactive cysteines. And if minocycline treatment here shown in blue, um, changes their activity or binds nearby a reactive site, the probe can no longer interact and you can read it out by mass spectrometry. And then what we found was almost anticlimactic because we found the cytoplasmic ribosome, which is essentially the same target that people have found in bacteria. And we also found that the binding site was conserved. And then you can do a, an S35 incorporation SN. You can see with increasing dosing, you get less and less S35 incorporation. But then it turned out minocycline is not just simple a translation inhibitor. What it actually does, it reduces ribosomal load. So these are sucrose gradients that we ran in Jamie Williamson's lab. And um, what that shows is, is essentially, these are right, this is the 40S ribosome, 60S ribosome. Here's a monosome, which means there's one ribosome per mRNA here, two, three, four, five, and so forth. And that is called ribosomal load, the number of ribosomes per mRNA. And what minocycline does, it essentially predominantly inhibits ribosomal load uh, uh, and, and reduces the polysome fraction and increases the monosome fraction, whether that one is all stalled ribosomes or whether that is um, uh, translating active ribosomes, we don't know, we try to figure out right now. But the interesting thing is there's actually a Parkinson's, a familiar Parkinson's mutation, which does the opposite, it increases translation. And the other thing that you need to know is newly synthesized proteins are the ones most susceptible to protein aggregation. So we think by shifting the equilibrium more to monosome, uh, aminocycline prevents protein aggregation. And now we know that, and the question, what needs to be done? So now we have a mechanism, and um, what we're trying to do now is to make eukaryocyclines, so non-antibiotic tetracyclines, that then can go back to the clinic and be, be tested for all the variety of diseases where people already started to um, test them, and then hopefully um, uh, we, we can replicate those uh, successes in the clinic with those new molecules. <coughs> 